Let's get two things established. An American psycho, Patrick Bateman, is A, going cuckoo, B, shown killing people. That said, does he actually kill anyone? It might sound crazy to think of at first because we see so many scenes where Bateman takes an axe to people or has to clean up after himself after a good cathartic murder. But remember the scene towards the end where his lawyer Harold tells him that Paul Allen isn't dead. And worse still, Paul Allen's apartment, the place Bateman was using to hide bodies, was never A. Paul Allen's apartment, B. Occupied. Which meant none of the bodies that Patrick Bateman stored there were actually there. So much of the film centers on the tension between the expectations of the world around Bateman, the way he's internalized that to the point that his personal identity is scrubbed away, and the real person under the mask who is still there and screaming to be let out, leading to Bateman's break from reality. Following the revelations from Harold, we're left to wonder if anything Bateman ever did in the movie was real or if it was all a product of his twisted mind being unable to break free and using homicidal ideation as an outlet for itself. But then again, there are parts of the movie that make it seem implausible that Bateman could have committed no crimes at all. Let's take a look back at some of the key moments of the film that give us some insight as to what actually happened. Paul Allen was still alive. Let's start with the first scene that casts doubt on whether Bateman killed anyone. If you somehow don't remember Paul Allen, he's the guy Bateman is obsessed with and obsessed with being. Paul Allen, played by Jared Leto, is perceived by Bateman as being better than him, but also being the same as him. He hates being confused with Allen, but wants to have what he has, become who he is. All the while, and any viewer can tell this is the case, there's no real difference between them. To Bateman, Allen almost seems like an embodiment of the obsessive materialism that Bateman and his friends are so caught up with throughout the entire film. Allen has a stunningly beautiful business card, wears expensive suits, and can always get reservations at Dorsia, the highly coveted restaurant referenced about a thousand times in the film. Bateman can't stand that Alan is constantly outdoing him. Naturally, Bateman wants to kill Alan. Green with envy? More like seeing red with it. Bateman gets the opportunity of a lifetime when Alan gets extremely drunk to the point that he doesn't seem to notice at all how incredibly on edge and weird Bateman is acting. Then, he gives Bateman the ultimate treat. He takes Bateman to his place, giving him the perfect opportunity to kill. When they get to the apartment, Alan sits down to listen to Huey Lewis in the news, too pissed drunk to even notice Bateman putting on a raincoat and taking an axe out of the bathroom. Gotta give Bateman props for that though, man was very careful about his appearance. You could call him a murderer, but he was not a slouch. Now ready, Bateman swings an axe from behind Alan and into his head. We don't see Paul Allen die on screen, but are you really going to think he wasn't dead when we saw Bateman attack him with an axe? No. But no one can find out Mr. Wall Street here killed the guy, so he leaves a fake voicemail to make it look like Allen just went to London. The movie takes advantage of our natural assumptions, and really, Bateman's natural assumption that if you hack at a guy's brains with an axe, they die. But when we talk to Harold towards the end of the movie, he tells us that he had dinner with Paul Allen a few days prior to talking to Bateman, meaning that Allen has to be alive at least long enough for him to have dinner with Harold. That dinner? It happened in London. Bateman panics. We get a feeling that maybe he hoped for some kind of catharsis, a confirmation that there's another him, a real him that is Patrick Bateman, no matter what he says in his opening monologue. While this and Harold's dinner with Alan are the biggest signs that Bateman may be an unreliable narrator, there are other hints scattered throughout the movie that seem to imply our psychotic skin fair aficionado has a few more screws loose than we're led to believe. Remember the iconic scene where Bateman drops a chainsaw down the stairs and on Christie? It's the kind of horrific shenanigans you would expect from a 2000s horror movie, but Let's pause for a moment and think of how likely it is for Bateman to execute a drop like that perfectly. How do you time dropping a chainsaw on someone so that it kills them the moment they step out to the center of the stairwell? Unless Bateman has a secret engineering degree he didn't tell us about and can run the numbers in his head, it seems highly unlikely that any of that was real. 
Second, Bateman's neighbors have to be completely absent, just deaf, or living in Gotham to be able to ignore a crime like this happening. As Christy, which is what Bateman nicknamed the sex worker, is fleeing from a nude and blood-colored Bateman, she's screaming at the top of her lungs and banging on neighboring doors. Bateman isn't being especially quiet either as he runs through the hallway revving a chainsaw. How did no one hear this unless Paul Allen is the only person who lived in that apartment building? It seems likely that Bateman never killed Christy, or at least didn't kill her in such a dramatic and conspicuous fashion. It's hard to believe that no one would have called the police. Even if it were a crime-ridden area where no one wants to snitch, it's not like the elite residents of a ritzy Manhattan apartment building all have something to fear from a guy who works in an office, no matter how prestigious his job is. The only explanation is that Bateman either A. hallucinated the whole thing, B. made it up in his head, C. killed Christy a different way. We'll go with option A, because we actually do see proof of Bateman having hallucinations. It's a little hard to think he's not capable of doing something gruesome, but it's even harder to think there's an ATM in New York that will order you to feed it a stray cat like some twisted animal sacrifice to our banking lords. At least, we hope not. New Yorkers, we know weird stuff happens in New York. Let us know if you've seen the American Psycho ATM out there. Anyway, Bateman is a reasonable guy. He actually gets a stray cat and holds a gun up to its head, putting an American twist to the traditional sacrificial dagger. An old lady spots Bateman, so not wanting any witnesses, despite his very obvious killing of Christie, he shoots the old lady. But it just makes things worse. There's police nearby and they've heard it. They start a manhunt on Bateman. This is when things get even weirder. You know how in movies they always make cars explode when they crash just so it looks cool? Not only does it not happen in real life, but what Bateman does stretches the limits of suspension of disbelief. Bateman shoots at the officers and it blows up the squad cars. It's so ridiculous that even Bateman pauses to stare at the pistol incredulously. Lastly, there's the notebook. Jean, who you may remember as Bateman's receptionist, finds a notebook on his desk with sketches of Christie being defiled and murdered in ways that could easily grace the halls of the r slash iblex subreddit. Now, for some people, the notebook is proof that Bateman is just fantasizing about killing people, but it could also be a way to memorialize the murders he's been up to, considering there are serial killers that keep sick trophies of their victims. It's not too far-fetched to say a real homicidal maniac would also draw his past murders in a notebook to relive them or memorialize them. For that reason, we don't think the notebook helps us draw any conclusions. But maybe the point is that we're never meant to know, really. If you go by author intent, what is clear is that the director didn't want us to think Bateman didn't kill anyone. You also get this impression from the novel by Brett Easton Ellis, on which the movie is based. In an interview with Charlie Rose, director Mary Harron said, One thing I think is a failure on my part is people keep coming out of the film thinking it's all a dream, and I never intended that. I think it's a failing of mine in, in, in the final scene that I, I just got the emphasis wrong, because I should have left it just more open-ended. Without wanting to give the plot away, it makes it seem like it's, I guess clearly, because people keep saying this to me, it makes it look like it, might all, it was all in his head, and it's, as far as I'm concerned, it's not. But does it matter if Bateman killed people? On some level, Bateman's murders are a cry for help, a desperate attempt for genuine emotional release and differentiation from the yuppies he's with and forced to play as. But no one knows, and even if they do, no one cares. Bateman could be a deranged serial killer, and it would seem that he actually might be, but no one would ever notice because they're too busy worrying about what kind of suit he's wearing or what the lettering on his business card looks like. There are also many scenes in American Psycho in which Bateman is mistaken for someone else, which serves to highlight the lack of individualism in his social circle, but also opens up the possibility that Harold didn't actually meet Paul Allen in London, but instead met with another interchangeable finance guy that he thought was Paul Allen. Not even he can tell Paul Allen apart from other people, despite his envy. If you want to go full English literature class with this, you could even say Alan is just another part of Bateman. The self he can't become, loathes for not being, but also loathes himself for wanting to be. If this is true, then the film seems to be making a statement that one of these Wall Street cronies could go missing and no one would notice because they're all so similar. 
At the end of the day, we can't really know which parts of the film are hallucinations and which events actually happened, but that's not really the point. The point is that Patrick Bateman is full on losing his mind throughout the entire film, either having deranged homicidal fantasies or actually murdering people on a nightly basis, and no one notices whatsoever. As long as Bateman shows up to the office in his fancy suit and glasses, as long as he drives a nice car, as long as he has a cushy apartment in the right part of town, he's assumed to just be another member of the crowd. Who cares if he's chopping people up in his free time? In that sense, aren't we all just Bateman?